Flying above California SR91 is a stylish and distinct landmark. This beacon rose from the heart of one of America's most treasured theme parks and has defined a piece of Orange County identity ever since. Its story begins with an old patriot, his daughter, and the Declaration of Independence. Welcome back to the farm. The recreation of Independence Hall was Walter Knott's grand achievement, combining his talent as a creator with his love of country. In 1966, at the age of 77, the old farmer decided to slow down and cede responsibilities of Knott's Bray Farm's operations and future to his children. His son Russell was the first to be responsible for management, while his sisters Virginia, Tony and Marion worked in retail. The next year, Marion Knott returned to the family business after serving on the audit committee of the Orange County Grand Jury, where she got a detailed look at the inner workings of other large companies and the sophisticated world of business. She got the sense that Knott was running their multi-million dollar business like a small country store. From simple things like hand-posted ledgers to more complex matters like capitalization. For the sake of profit, we cultivate the land. We build great factories to produce goods. We sell for profit. The goods thus produced, we transport over large distances, still for the sake of profit. Those who have savings often invest or lend them, hoping for a share of profit. And in so doing, help to build the industrial might of the nation. Marion was alarmed and felt compelled to change the family's bumpkin ways. Growing up, Marion, her sisters and brother worked long hours for their parents, picking berries and waiting on tables at the tea room, all while attending school. After high school, Marion decided to blaze her own trail and attended the University of Southern California. In her third year, she left USC to get married and return to the farm. Along with her sister, she applied her knowledge of the fashion industry to open Marion and Tony's sports shop where the pair worked in middle management roles. The grand jury experience opened Marion's eyes to advanced systems of accounting, budgeting, planning, credit, and auditing. To a simple country girl, it was a humbling experience. Marion spoke up at one of the family's board meetings and advocated for new protocols and procedures. She was the baby of the brood, but she was also the only one that could grasp the situation and the benefits of modernizing. For her gumption, Marion was tasked with the most daunting job on the farm. Director of Design, Planning and Entertainment, Dad's old job. Dad finished the work started by Rudolph Boysen in developing the Boysenberry. Every Boysenberry in the world today had its origin right here at the farm. This is where we started. Of course, it didn't take my mother long to find out that the Boysenberries made marvelous pies and jams that we started selling here in 1932. The move gave Marion self-confidence, which she would need as she took to expand in the theme park. Marion's first initiative was realized on June 7th, 1968, when Knott's enclosed the amusement park and began charging a mission. For $1, guests could access the ghost town and purchase individual ride tickets for the farm's attractions. To their surprise, the Knott family watched attendance increase. With the emission revenue, the little park invested in infrastructure and enhancements and Marion got to work on new guest offerings. Until 1969, the farm only had one theme land, Ghost Town. The amusement sprinkled around the rest of the property weren't connected by any story or thread. That all changed when Marion hired Jimmy Jones of Long Beach to design her concept for an area inspired by California's Mexican roots. Fiesta Village was designed as a tribute to the charm of early California. Here you can stroll to the music of mariachi bands and browse through open stall gift markets. Fiesta Village was anchored by nostalgia, a value Marion inherited from her father and a guiding principle she would need as she pioneered the future of her family's land. The property beyond the Calico Mine had been many things over the years. Berry fields, parking, semi-scenic pathways for the railroad and borough ride, more parking, storage space for construction equipment, and of course, even more parking. 
After the success of Fiesta Village, Marion saw the opportunity to incorporate the free parking zone into the theme park. She scrambled for a theme that was creative, vibrant, and untapped. She raised $2 million and built a whole new land from scratch. Opening in late May of 1971, Gypsy Camp would become Knott's biggest folly since the Mark Smith Horse Show. On paper, the expansion had a lot going for it. A 2,000 seat indoor theatre with a dazzling water curtain and daily ice skating shows. The largest arcade west of the Mississippi. A fortune teller, magic shop and bazaar all inhabiting a mountain 13 meters tall with walkways illuminated by nearly 100 torches. All this was brought to life by a myriad of strolling performers in festive costumes. Unfortunately, two flaws doomed the addition. First, no rides. Though a high intensity spinner was planned for the peak of the mountain, it never materialized. Second, the finished rockwork was horrible and looked like a crumpled paper bag. Compounding these problems was the gypsy theme, which didn't connect with anything else in the park and generally bored guests. The situation was discouraging, Marion might have moved too quickly with the gypsy camp, risking the farm's reputation as well as its financial stability. The failure didn't set her back though, she believed the only limitation in business was one's own thinking. As a woman that didn't want to be defined by just gender identifiers, she was determined to be her own person and for her that meant creating a hit. Gypsy camp wasn't a total loss. Engineers confirmed the framework could be converted into something new, or in the case of Marion's next idea, something old. But raising more money was going to be hard. Gypsy Camp was only three years old, and scrapping it meant no return on investment. What could Knott's possibly offer to regain the backers' trust? That'll do. Marion Knott raised more money to fund her second shot. She was up there with the big kids, and this time there was no margin for error. She had to pick a good theme, and the best place to figure that out was a short burrow ride southeast. Every day of the year, thousands of guests come to Knott's Berry Farm to walk through the streets of a real ghost town. Everywhere you look, you're reminded of our great western heritage. Ghost Town set the standard for placemaking on the farm. Walter's boomtown sprung from a dream to honor family law and the decades when his parents came to California. It wasn't a theme drawn out of a 10 gallon hat. It was a universe based on real places, real challenges and real characters. A universe of old time adventurers. Now she had it. Marion dreamed up a land to memorialize the decade when her own mum and dad opened the farm. It was a decade sizzling with vigor and electricity. A decade of enterprise and ambition. A time when America roared. In November 1974, Marion announced her new land the Roaring Twenties Amusement Area. Opening the following June, the park had only seven months to deconstruct Gypsy Camp and build up facilities for a Mack Matterhorn Himalaya ride, bumper cars, a dark ride, and the world's first inverted metal roller coaster. Designer Rick Campbell was selected to lead and imbued the simple period construction with charm and Americana. And of course, one thing had to be named after Marion's mum. This is knots after all. A flashy neon sign welcomed guests into Charleston Circle. The circle connected the Good Time Theatre with all of the new offerings. The main attraction of the new land was the Quartz Group. Marion travelled the world in search of unique attractions. Upon discovering the Corkscrew prototype at Arrow's Mountain View facility, she persuaded her siblings to purchase the prototype just as soon as the design's review was concluded. Proving there's really nothing new under the sun, just modifications and improvements, is the corkscrew in a class all by itself. In 1901, they called a similar ride Loop the Loop. As the 24-car train comes off the crest into the first descent, you're moving at 45 miles an hour. Going through the helix, the train slows to 38 miles an hour. And the ride supervisor told me that even though you may feel like you're in grave danger, if you place a dime in your extended palm, it'll still be there when you return to right side up again. At the time of its debut, Corkscrew not only held the record of being the first metal coaster to send riders upside down, it was the first of any roller coaster to do it twice. The inversions traveled over a pond so that riders could see reflections of themselves mid-roll. Even though the coaster was just 70 feet tall with a ride duration of 90 seconds, Corkscrew had the moxie that Marion needed to sell her new land to coaster aficionados. 
In early July, the space above the arcade welcomed the fourth ride of the new land. Knott's Berry Tales was a traditional dark ride designed by Imagineer Roly Crump, featuring a story that referenced the farm's preserving kitchen, cable cars, and even the defunct gypsy camp. Its history is weird, magnificent, and worthy of its own expedition. The new land smashed expectations. Led by corkscrew, park attendance shot up 52%. This was the good news. The bad news? Lines. With only four rides, wait times ballooned. Also, there were not enough dining options for the large crowds. Marion saw an opportunity and developed the last five acres of the property. Rick Campbell was brought back as designer and focused on another facet of the 1920s, the barnstorming era. By the fall of 75, C&I Construction had been hired and new buildings and rides started going up. The Roaring Twenties airfield invited guests to craft their own story as brave aviators in a unique theme land. Walkways lit by colourful runway lights connected Charleston Circle to 10 new attractions, restaurants and rides. The airfield eatery offered buffet service on the ground floor and seating for 400 upstairs. Nearby, a 1929 Aerosport aeroplane was on display, one of only three models in existence and was flown into the farm at the land's grand opening. Burgers and fries could be found at the Glider Diner and shops and midway games continued the aviation aesthetic. This famous Roaring Twenties taper wing is beautiful in form, even without smoking or stunting. The historic Wright Whirlwind engine, known for Lindbergh's crossing of the Atlantic, looks great with its cylinders sticking out in the breeze. And all of those airframe wires sing a song of the excitement of Roaring Twenties aviation. The propeller ride trained aviators to enjoy increasing centrifugal force while their vehicle pitched and tilted. The loop trainer flying machine aided pilots that were unfamiliar with inversions. For visitors that wanted a more grounded experience, there was the Gasoline Alley Auto Ride, a leisurely spin through a 1920s countryside in antique cars powered by new Honda engines. What is it with this place and car rides? The pace picked up with the motorcycle chase. Unlike normal steeplechase vehicles that had guest legs straddling the track, the motorcycle seated riders high above. The chase reaches speeds of 65 km per hour as bikers darted around Gasoline Alley. The motorcycles really did race, though the only factor was gravity. Guests loved the experience on the motorcycles, but safety became a major concern due to the rider's high center of gravity. After four years of operation, numerous injuries and complaints, the park was forced to exchange the motorcycles for lower profile cars. <laughs> All you buckaroos, Knott's Berry Farm's wacky soapbox racer is about to take off for yet another real wacky ride to Catnip Junction. The solution came from a local and recent high school graduate, Eddie Soto, who had been hired at Knott's after pitching a raft ride concept. Opened in 1980, wacky soapbox racers traveled the same track as its predecessor with a decreased speed of 45 km per hour, making the attraction friendlier to families. Guests boarded plank and caster cars for a heat through the cartoonish world of Catnip Junction. The sets and effects were built entirely on the farm. Fitting to the 1920s theme, Spike Jones and the Firehouse Five recorded a jazzy and zany soundtrack. It was the first attraction on the farm to feature a rat infested sewer. Lovely. It wouldn't be the 1920s without a party, so Knott's opened Cloud Nine Ballroom for guests of all ages. The dance floor offered 1,400 square meters of space to boogie down to disco, twist and shout to rock, or lindy hop to swing music. Parents appreciated that the venue was smoke and alcohol free. Kids appreciated that they didn't have to dance with a partner. Cloud9 required separate emission and only operated from 7 to 11 p.m. Well, are you ready now for the big one? You're looking at it, 20 stories tall. It's the tallest of its kind in the world. It even has a sky cabin that revolves as it goes up and down. And 12 parachutes to thrill you to the core. The most eye-catching and impressive of all the airfield's attractions was the 20-story tall sky jump. Intamin produced their parachute rides based on the paratroopers' practice towers of the former Soviet Union. On Knott's version, riders stood in chest-high metal cages and were reeled up to the end of the cantilever and then dropped. The descent was slowed by the parachute above. Marion was not a fan of thrill rides and rode them only as work required. 
Of the Sky Jump, she said, you come down, but your stomach stays up there. Sky Jump was built around the Sky Cabin, an observation deck that also travelled the tower. The Sky Cabin was the tallest structure in Orange County when it opened in 1976. On clear days, riders can see as far as Santa Catalina Island, downtown Los Angeles, or places nearby. The top of Sky Cabin's tower was emblazoned with the new Knott's K, a symbol to the world that the farm was truly and fully one of the state's great theme parks. Marion's new land roared with excitement and originality, but by 1979, guests were looking for even bigger thrills elsewhere. So here we go on Colossus, a six million dollar roller coaster built for people who like a thrill every once in a while. It is the world's largest wooden roller coaster, two cars parallel to each other, racing for about three and a half minutes. The first drop is 119 feet and the second drop is a little over 100 feet. Here we go. The farm's attendance dipped. The family of board members struggled to come to a consensus on what to do, so they decided to bring in outside help. In 1981, the Knotts family hired Terry Van Gorder as general manager to help steer their park back into prominence. Terry came from Magic Mountain, where as CEO, he had built up an impressive roster of attractions, especially coasters. In 1979, he brokered the sale of the Magic Mountain to Six Flags and effectively pushed himself out of a job. By the end of 1981, Knott's Berry Farm had climbed back up to the third most visited amusement park in America. Still, the market was crowded and the farm had to do more to get public attention. For the past few years, Marion had been working on plans for a kiddie land to occupy the Grand Avenue parking lot. Negotiations were open with Charles Scholes to have his famous Peanuts characters complement the new land along with 30 new attractions, shows and eateries. But what's Camp Snoopy really going to be? How big is it? Well, there's so many questions, Marion Knott herself and Terry Van Gorder, Knott's general manager, called a press conference to clear the air. That this area is, not only do we think it is a beautiful area, but I'm in love with Snoopy and I'm glad Snoopy is going to have a camp and stay with us. So a model was built and it was everything Snoopy and the Knott family wanted, mountains, trees, a huge lake, a complete playground where kids and grown-ups alike can play just like they're way up in the high Sierras. Then in December, just a week shy of his 92nd birthday, the old farmer passed away, closing a chapter for both the farm and Southern Californian theme parks. Marion, now in her 60s, started to pull back from the park and Terry took creative control, filling the design and planning team with talent from his Magic Mountain days. By the time Camp Snoopy opened in 1983, Marion was all but removed from the farm's development, having devoted herself to philanthropy. Terry was appointed president and CEO in 1984, and used his designers to reshape Knott's Berry Farm to appeal to teens and less conservative audiences. Knott's Roaring Twenties lasted for 21 years. In 1996, the charms of yesteryear were exchanged for the bland, storyless hallmarks of the mid-1990s. An update had been in the works for some time. Initial plans would have the area take on a more elaborate overlay with a Race to Atlantis roller coaster, hammerhead themed Zamperla rotor shake, and a collection of restaurants and shops inspired by the Pacific Rim sporting a bold World's Fair style. Instead, management opted for a cheap seaside amusement reduction executed with some highly questionable design choices. Where riders once raced with motorcycles and soapbox cars, now guests strap in for Intamin's first hydraulic launch coaster. Where revelers once danced on silvery clouds among the stars, now passers-by see shut doors open only for private events. And where once the sound of daring skydivers filled the air with laughter and bravado, now only the screams of visitors on the nearby turbo dropper heard. Everything changed. Well, almost everything. Marion's impact in Orange County has been astonishing. Uh, she's involved with many organizations. The thing about Marion is she truly cares about especially young people, the next generation. She wants to help young people to make society better. Marion's philanthropy spanned a wide array of causes, especially for women, children, and education. She funded a nursing education center in Newport Beach. In 2007, she donated $8 million for a film and TV studio at Chapman University, where she served on the Board of Trustees. Besides philanthropy, Marion was a role model to the industry. 
In 1980, she served as the first female director on the board of directors of the International Association of Amusement Parks and Attractions. As an executive, Marion grew her family's one-time berry stand to a destination visited by 4 million guests each year with over $278 million in revenue. Oh well, here we are at Boot Hill. Now this does look authentic. Yeah, it does. And this, this was put here by your dad as well. Uh-huh. Well, put your foot right there. Oh. You hear a heartbeat? You can feel a heartbeat <laughs> underneath your foot. <laughs> now, how many years? That's been here forever and ever and ever. <laughs> That's the oldest trick in the world. There, you can, when you put your foot here, you can feel a beating like it's a heartbeat. Right. <laughs> and you still get a kick out of seeing people do that, don't you? Yes, I do. See, I think you all have got a lot of showbiz blood in you as well. Oh, we've just grown up with it. Yeah. Now. I think so. On the night of November 13th, 2014, Marion Knott drifted off to sleep for her final dream. We'll never know what visions she had that night, but we can be sure they were grand. Born on the farm, raised through the depression, she was a chip off the old block and one of a kind. Though the land memorializing her parents wouldn't last, Marion's modernization of the family business and expansion of the park guaranteed the farm's long-term survival, whilst the rest of Orange County's early amusement parks faded into history. More now on our breaking news. Rescuers trying to help trapped passengers on the Sky Cabin ride at Knott's Berry Farm. Stu Mandel is live overhead in Sky 2, Sue. Well, we're watching now as the firefighters from Orange County Fire Authority made their way all the way to the top of this 300-foot pole where that sky cabin would have been at the top. Now, we know it's stuck about halfway. You can see one of those firefighters right there on that ladder. We understand they're going to repel down to the cabin itself. 18 riders still on board that cabin right there. They're about 150 feet from the, excuse me, 130 feet from the ground. Looks like they're going to be doing a repel of about 130 feet. Live in Sky 2 over Knott's Berry Farm. I'm Stu Mandel. Back to you guys at the studio. In December of 2016, the Sky Cabin was shut down after the observation deck got stuck 30 meters in the air. The park's new owner, Cedar Fair, could have used the opportunity to remove the aging attraction, but instead doubled down on a recent strategy to market the farm's heritage. When the Sky Cabin reopened in February of the following year, guests found an improved attraction, with up-to-date lighting, new windows, new floors, and a refreshed interior. The most telling commitment of all was the installation of a new air conditioning system, keeping the observation deck cool during the Southland's many hot and sunny days. The Roaring Twenties amusement area and airfield brought visitors to the edge of their seats and pushed the boundaries of the park to their absolute limits. Powered by nostalgia, it was an inspired theme that transported guests to a world of story and heart. Less than 20 years later, a fledgling park eight miles down the road would bank on that same inspired theme after receiving its own billion dollar second chance. The airfield's landmark tower stands as tall today as it did in 1976. Its iconic red and white checkerboard may have been replaced with the colors of Old Glory, but the family's signature on top remains, keeping watch on the trusty horizon, a reminder that Knott's Berry Farm will always be the home of old-time adventures. Thank you so much for joining this episode of Expedition Theme Park. Do you have memories of the Roaring Twenties at Knott's Berry Farm? Please let us know and share your stories in the comments below. A special thank you as always to our Patreons. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition and follow us on Twitter and Instagram for information about upcoming episodes. We will see you next time. <laughs>